The United States and Iran are on the verge of a deal on releasing prisoners and releasing frozen funds. But is this an exception or a movement towards better ties? Workers at Chevron's LNG projects in Australia went on strike towards the end of last week. What are their demands? And activists in Atlanta and the United States are facing persecution for resisting an urban warfare police training facility. What is the charge against these activists and how are they fighting back? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Our first story is from the convoluted world of US-Iran ties. The United States took a step further in implementing a deal whereby the two countries will exchange five prisoners each and Iran will be able to access six billion dollars of its own money. Now this money was frozen in South Korea and the US government last week signed a waiver that allowed banks in various countries to process this money. Now once this money is processed, it will go to Qatar Central Bank. From there, Iran will be able to use this money to buy humanitarian goods. We go to Abdul to understand the contours of this deal and what it implies. Abdul, thanks for joining us. So we know there were details of the deal, so to speak. Five prisoners from each side being exchanged and $6 billion likely to be released. But could you maybe take us through a bit of the context for this uh, deal to take place? What is the $6 billion in the first place? Why is South Korea involved of all countries? Well, uh, South Korea is one of the countries uh, which used to import a lot of uh, Iranian energy products like natural oil and ga gas before the sanctions uh, were imposed in 2018, and and these the, primarily these uh, six billion dollars are the payments which were due to the Iranian uh, Iranians for the supply of energy products. So that's how it uh, the, the six billion dollars were there in the South Korean banks. But before South Korea could make the payment, uh, the sanctions were imposed, and because of the sanctions, South Korea was the South Korean government one of course being a lie, a close ally to the U.S also uh, uh, being scared about uh, being impacted by the sanctions, secondary uh, sanctions, which could have uh, affected their, if they have carried out the payment to Iranian banks. So uh, that basically led to a kind of uh, 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 these $6 billion being stuck in, uh, in South Korean banks for uh, all these years. This has been more than almost five years uh, since this has happened. Uh, and uh, all these years, by the way, Iranians were in talk uh, with uh, South Koreans to basically release this, uh, kind of find some ways to basically use that money to uh, uh, for uh, at least non-sanctioned products to basically import some things from South Korea. But uh, uh, as I said before, South Korea being a very close ally to uh, US basically became, it is it became very difficult for uh, Iranians to kind of convince South Koreans to do what is required to do. So that is the basic uh, uh, reason uh, behind this. Also, the, uh, the third parties being involved, now they are being involved in the deal. For example, Switzerland and other European countries, Ireland uh, uh, and Germany also uh, have, been, have become part of it. Given the fact that earlier, uh, before the, uh, even after the US imposed sanctions, the European countries had the possibility of doing the same thing uh, because they were not part of the sanctions imposed by the US. But again, the geopolitics became much more important. The closeness of Europeans to the US became much more important than the deal, uh, which they uh, till very recently were very vocal, vocally in support of. They were not, they were always saying that the European Union, the three members which originally signed the deal, Iran nuclear deal uh, in 2016 have not abandoned the deal despite their proclamations of not abandoning the deal they did not move to do the similar things before because of the pressure now that the US has agreed all those uh, uh, difficulties have been uh, uh, resolved and Abdul and I guess the threat of secondary sanctions on the banks in various European countries which, which would have enabled this transfer was maybe the uh, another major factor that also inhibited many of these countries from taking part as well. Interesting that money which was owed to Iran uh, for a business deal was not, they could not, Korea could not pay it because of all these issues. But another key question I wanted to ask was also that in the context of this 
uh, tension you described. We know that Donald Trump withdrew in 2018 from the deal. Biden said he would come back. Uh, various rounds of talks took place. Nothing would happen. Do you see this as a kind of pos a major positive step forward? Like, is it part of a trend or is it more of a one-off deal which may, may not necessarily affect the JCPOA process or the restoration of the deal? Well, uh, given the approach which Biden administration has adopted ever since uh, it's coming to power, uh, after the initial few months, uh, very uh, enthusiastically participating in the Vienna dialogues and in dialogues in other places, uh, it, it became very clear that Biden administration does not want to revive the deal as it had promised earlier. And, I, and, and there are no uh, reasons to believe at this moment that that particular approach of Biden administration has basically uh, has changed. It seems that uh, uh, U.S. has uh, no interest at this moment to revive the deal. So in, in that context, we can safely conclude that this uh, uh, deal is basically one of deal, which is basic limited to the uh, uh, basically this uh, releasing the $6 million all only because the U.S. was pressurized enough by the Iranians and by the uh, things which are happening all across the world at this moment to basically find out a way to get some uh, somehow uh, Iranians to agree that uh, to basically release the six uh, five prisoners uh, U.S. prisoners. So they were basically compelled because of the constraints in the domestic politics and uh, the larger geopolitical events which are happening all across the world to basically uh, uh, agree to this particular uh, deal. And, and that's why this is one of deal uh, and most probably and this is not going to and this does not indicate that there is going to be a revival of the JCPOA. Uh, one should also remember that the US does not want to revive the JCPOA at this moment primarily because it thinks that any revival of that deal uh, lifting of this will lead to lifting of the sanctions and all the constraints which Iranians are feeling at this moment, whatever constraints they are, despite the fact that these uh, sanctions are imposed, Iranians have increased their uh, oil production, gas production, their exports have increased recently. Uh, and because of the deals with China and Russia, they have been able to kind of overcome the the limitations which sanctions had imposed. Nevertheless, there is some kind of uh, constraints which sanction imposed on Iran. And uh, also we should not uh, uh, minus the factor of Israel in, the, in this entire uh, 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 game. Given all these uh, possibilities and all these geopolitical calculations, that there is no reason uh, for the US at this moment to revive the JCPOA. So this can safely be con uh, considered as one of the, yeah. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, also the looming prospect of the U.S. presidential elections next year, you know, giving even less incentive for Biden to uh, strike a deal because he'll be accused of what the Republicans say is enabling terrorism. And I think they've said exactly the same thing now as well. But thank you so much for that analysis. We now take a look at strikes at Chevron plants in Australia. Since Friday, September 8th, around 500 workers at two of the largest LNG projects of Chevron initiated a series of short strikes. The offshore Chevron plants in Western Australia account for over 5% of the global LNG production. Meanwhile, the oil and gas conglomerate has responded with hostility. Over the weekend, Chevron petitioned Australia's labour regulator, the Fair Work Commission, to intervene and break the strikes. It claimed that no reasonable prospect of agreement existed. We now talk to Anish, who has been tracking this story. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, could you first start with maybe what are the demands presented by the workers uh, working in the Chevron projects? Well, uh, the primary demand is a fair uh, wage contract, and that is something that we are not seeing. That is not uh, new or specific to this industry at the moment in Australia, or even for that matter, uh, you know, in other parts of the world. Uh, this is uh, something that is part of a larger trend of uh, labor uh, movement, organization, and mobilization that we're seeing in the past few years. And this is just part of that. The fact that these 500, uh, and we have to also consider that there is, uh, we're talking about uh, oil rigs, offshore oil rigs, um, and that requires a certain kind of different, uh, you know, safety standards and, uh, you know, workplace uh, environment that should be different for uh, them as well. 
So workers have been talking about uh, being overworked, uh, not uh, having enough rest. They are also talking about how uh, there is, uh, you know, their safety standards are getting lax by, uh, by the years. And there are certain things that they want to add, uh, which is not being, uh, uh, you know, even considered by the company at the moment. Uh, the, but the issue, the primary issue right now is the fact that Chevron doesn't want to talk. It doesn't want to bargain. And that is primarily the reason why the strike is happening right now. And uh, so even even with, uh, you know, because we do not have a great deal of, uh, you know, detailed uh, demands uh, publicly available because the bargaining for the union is ongoing. Uh, the fact that this has been, they have been pushed to a strike, uh, short, a very progressive set of uh, short strikes, which uh, they're planning to move on to a 24 hour strike uh, since, uh, from beginning from September 14th. Uh, requires a certain kind of complete intractability from the company. And it is quite interesting how Chevron is now uh, the one trying to complain uh, to the Fair Works Commission, uh, saying that uh, there is no, uh, you know, there's no negotiation that is possible right now. And it clearly shows they're trying to turn the tables and trying to even stretch uh, the definition or within the Fair Work Act uh, on a whole host of issues, especially with the fact that whether or not a contract uh, or even a negotiated contract is possible at the moment. So they're trying to push the laws uh, in this moment. Uh, and this clearly shows that they do not want to talk. And Anish, any expected impact on global production, especially because I think there's at least 5% of total production comes from Australia's projects? Yes, definitely. Uh, so these two uh, projects itself uh, account for five percent, as you pointed out, and that has already created a major impact. So we've seen about you know a sudden one day increase of over 13, 14 percent in Europe uh, of uh, LNG uh, products, and that in itself shows the massive impact that it will have. And we must remember that Australia is one of the biggest producer, in fact, the biggest producer for a country of uh, LNG, and they account for about 20%, Western Australia alone accounts for about 20% of the global share. Even domestically speaking, uh, these two plants uh, pretty much account for about half of Western Australia's domestic consumption. And that itself shows how significant the strike is with we might be looking at a smaller, relatively small scale strike with, you know, about uh, close to about 500 workers, striking workers at the moment. But the impact that they're making is massive and it is making, you know, creating ripples across the, not just the industry, but like, you know, the global supply chain right now. But uh, they are also, uh, in a way, the victims of uh, the recent crisis in global supply chain. They are the ones who have been impacted by, uh, you know, the rising cost of living crisis. And that is something that uh, is yet to be very, uh, you know, sustainably resolved uh, either by the government or by the industry. And that is something that the workers want to shine, uh, uh, you know, shine attention on. And that is something, uh, that is the reason why this uh, strike is something, something, you know, takes up, up significantly uh, uh, more uh, impact right now in the global frame of things. Well, Anish, thanks so much for that analysis. Keep tracking that story because we might come back for further developments as well. And our final story is from the United States, where a petition for a vote on the controversial Cop City project in Atlanta has gained over 115,000 signatures. Now, Cop City is an urban warfare training facility for the police that is proposed to be built on forest land. Now, this project has been opposed by a cross-section of activists and citizens groups, although the administration has refused to hear their concerns. In fact, some days ago, nearly 60 activists who were resisting this project were hit with racketeering charges. We go to People's Dispatches, Natalia Marcus for more. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us. Could you maybe begin by first talking about what is the latest uh, step of the protest by those who are resisting Cop City? There's talk of a petition. What is this petition for and what is the idea of taking it forward? Um, you know, the latest iteration of, of the struggle in um, the popular movement against um, the um, proposed training center for police in the city of Atlanta. Um, organizers with the Cop City Vote Coalition have successfully raised and submitted over 116,000 signatures to the city clerk in support of a 
popular referendum on the training center being built um, where the people of Atlanta will be able to actually vote and decide um, if they want, you know, tens of millions of dollars allocated to a police training center that will um, allow um, Atlanta police and police from around the country to come and train in um, repression tactics for, you know, urban movements, urban popular uprisings, um, you know, marginalized communities, etc. Um, of course, you know, if the referendum does indeed happen, it's widely expected that the people of Atlanta will vote against Cop City because it's extraordinarily unpopular. Um, but um, as of now, the Cop City Vote Coalition is still trying to actually get these signatures to the city of Atlanta, um, which is, as they claim, stonewalling democracy um, and actually not, um, you know, not validating all of these signatures to begin the process of having a referendum, right? Um, you know, they have been, the city of Atlanta, as these organizers claim, um, have been d slow in their responses to the organizers, have, um, you know, not been, not expressed total clarity and are trying to bypass this democratic process that these organizers have been able to um, organize. Um, and this is not new. There have been many such claims that the city of Atlanta and, and Georgia as a state have been acting extremely undemocratically in the way that they have been trying to push through this um, cop city, this police training ground, by any means necessary. Right, Natalia, but we've seen that over the past many months, there's been continuous repression against those who have been resisting this cop city project. We know that their voices have not been heard, but there have also been charges filed against them, the racketeering charges being the most recent. So could you also maybe take us to the kind of repression the administration of Atlanta has been meeting out against these protesters? So, you know, most recently, before this, um, 61 activists in the Stop Cop City movement were hit with um, racketeering charges, um, which are, you know, nonsensical, quite frankly. Um, a lot of the defendants have been previously charged with very trumped up um, charges like um, money laundering as a result of running a bail fund, um, being put in jail for monitoring protests, being arrested for handing out flyers, and even domestic terrorism, which is by far, you know, the most egregious charge. Um, but now the sheer number of defendants that are being charged by the state of Georgia um, with racketeering really shows how the mass movement to stop Cop City is being put down in every sort of way, um, using all legal means, you know, the petition signatures getting ignored, um, the repression tactics against protesters, a protester being murdered by police, um, you know, through this struggle um, in, you know, um, in the height of this struggle, um, even from the very beginning, in 2021, when Cop City was first proposed and residents, you know, flocked to provide, you know, hours of public comment um, that were ignored by the city of Atlanta and, um, you know, in favor of simply pushing through this training ground for repression for police. Um, and notably, in the... Um, in the charges of racketeering for the 61 activists, um, it traces the start of, um, of this criminal conspiracy, so-called criminal conspiracy, to May 25th, 2020, which was when George Floyd was murdered by Derek Chauvin, um, igniting the largest anti-police brutality protest in U.S. history, which was, you know, far before the movement to stop Cop City even began. So even the state um, is linking um, movements against police repression 
and brutality and militarization across different time periods, um, you know, to sort of imply that um, the movement against police brutality is some sort of criminal conspiracy in itself, um, which um, sort of inadvertently shows how all of these different movements um, in the United States are heavily linked um, and, you know, are actually um, have similar goals and similar aspirations and, um, you know, are in this broader historical continuum of the people rising up against brutality. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. Do come back and watch tomorrow's episode of Daily Debrief as well. Also visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for videos and stories of struggles from across the world. Thank you.